Hi, hello, and welcome to the show. I'm your host, Kat, and today I want to talk to you about Hollywood. If you have followed me on Instagram, been on my website, you know that I'm an artist and that I have a very, very soft spot for old Hollywood, meaning the time from the inception of Hollywood until like the 1950s, I guess, 1960s. This is what I really love. These were the real stars, um, I think. And there have been stories, there have been personalities in a way that you won't find anymore today. Although I still value lots of actors and actresses and filmmakers today. I don't want to take away from that. But I just love the opulence, the elegance, the PR machine around old Hollywood. Because, a little step back, old Hollywood has been defined by the old studio system, which is not in existence anymore. So the studio system back then was like there were two or three big studios in Hollywood and they hired actors. You know, you were an employee of a studio if you were an actor. And uh, you got your weekly salary and they decided what kind of project to do and they decided who they would lend you to. Like they would lend you to another studio, to another filmmaker. They would send you abroad. You were just like a little pawn in a chess play. You were an employee. And if you look at today, you basically have freelance actors. Um, The studios are just commissioning their like backing projects, but it's not like they're the company and they're doing the thing and they do it with the people they employ, but it's all like a, on a project or a gig basis. So it's a huge freelance industry now. So back in the days, you had like those huge studios with their employees, their actors, and they devised these big careers for them, how they would mold them, what kind of image they would get them. They decided what they would look like, what they should look like. And this is also when the great fashions for the stars was devised. You had like a costume designer like Edith Hart or Adrian or um, Travilla and they really looked at the actress or the actor and tried what best suits them, their personality, their body type. And for each person, they came up with what works best for them. So it was not like this movie is going to be sponsored by Dolce & Gabbana. This is why everybody is wearing Dolce & Gabbana. But okay, this person has broad shoulders, as it was in the case of John Crawford. And um, Adrian decided on a look which was pretty much her own. There were dresses with like those huge shoulder pads and like the narrow hips and very streamlined because she was tall and it was just like on her body. It was not like off the the, the racks. It was just hers. So this is why I love Hollywood so much, old Hollywood so much, because they were like, this is the, the actress for this kind of role. And it was just, you know, the money that was spent on creating the image, the wardrobe, the dresses. It's just what lights up my heart as a fashion designer and as an artist. There was just so much going in there. And I find that in old Hollywood, there are lots of very interesting women that I love to study. I have lots of books of different people, of different women, actresses and designers and musicians and all kinds of backgrounds of what they did, how they got created, because this is what happened during old Hollywood. And I find you can get teachings and learnings out of their lives. And they're just interesting. They're just interesting. So I want to share some of those stories with you because I think you can learn things from them as well. And today I want to talk to you about a person that I really admire and I think she's fascinating and that is Natasha Rambova. You probably have never heard of her. She is mainly a costume designer. This is what people know her for. And I give you the gist of her life. 
She is not a Russian, as you would think when you hear her name. She's actually an American. She was um, an American and she started a education as a ballet dancer at the age of 17. And it was against her parents' will that she started that. And she started dancing with the Russian Imperial Ballet in New York. And she started a romantic relationship with her teacher, who was 15 years her senior by the name of Theodor Koslov. She was so inspired by the Russian Imperial Theatre or Ballet from Koslov, from you know, the way of living and uh, emotionality, that she just adopted the Russian name of Natasha Rombova. And she went with Koslov to Los Angeles. This is where people went because the film business went from New York to Hollywood during that phase. Because also an interesting fact, the American cinema history started in New York. This is where all the major companies started out. But of course, as we all know, on the West Coast, you have more stable weather, so better conditions to make movies. This is why everyone relocated from New York to Los Angeles, as did Koslov and Rambova. So she went there with him and he got an engagement by Cecil D. Mill. But at the end, basically, Rambova did all the work. She sketched, she researched, she came up with the concepts. And a Russian filmmaker, a woman named Ala Nisamova, who you should also Google, because she is so inspiring. So Alana Zimova, she discovered Rambova. She found her sketches. She saw what she can do, how fast she could work. And she said, I'm going to have you working as a costume designer in my movies. So Rambova started her career as a costume designer by accident, basically, with Nasimova. And she was one of the big ones. Like in the 1920s, she was one of the go-to costume designers. But she was so engaged in the whole lifestyle. She wanted to try her hand at acting. She had an education as a ballet dancer. She knew costume design. She knew how actresses and actors had to move, what the ins and outs were. She was on the set all the time. So she dabbed her hand at acting. And this is when she met her man, the one and only Rodolfo Valentino. You should know that name. He was like the heartthrob of old Hollywood. In the silent movie era, he was the man. He was just handsome and dark and he was just like dreamy. And she met him and she married him. But the whole thing which was kind of a fairy tale, you know, this wonderful, creative, beautiful woman meeting this wonderful, dreamy, beautiful man and they get married. But the thing is, he wanted to have a wife, a housewife and a mother, someone he couldn't get, come home to at night. But she, Natasha Rambova, famously said, well, yes, it's nice to be married. It is nice to be at home with babies, but you cannot have it simultaneously with a career. And I want a career. She was very adamant that she wanted to work, that she wanted to continue the path that she started at 17 when she started her belly dance education against the will of her parents. She wanted to stay that course. She wanted to be the person deciding of her own life. So when she decided to work, although being married, this is when the marriage started to suffer. They weren't happy anymore. And the thing which came additional to that was all the movies that Valentino, like the superstar of that era, all the movies that he made during his marriage to Rambova failed. They were box office flops, basically. And Hollywood was basically waging a war against Rambova, that she destroyed him and that she had too much power over him. So she was like disenchanted by the marriage. He was disenchanted because he didn't get the kids and the housewife that he wanted. So they decided to call it quits and to end the marriage. And Rambova even got further. And she said, oh, I, I don't want to be at Hollywood anymore. I'm going back to New York where I started it all. And that's where she opened a couture boutique. 
and she designed clothes there. She designed jewelry and she was just like her own couture label designer and she had her own thing. She was self-employed. She was independent. But then the Great Depression came to the US and before it ruined her, she fled to France. She was independent. She was a woman of means and she just wanted to live a good life. So she fled to France and that's where she got to know an aristocrat, like a wealthy man. And they married very shortly after meeting, actually. And he traveled with her around the world and to Egypt. And this is where she fell head over heels in love with the country, with its history, with the mystery and with everything. She started a lifelong study of Egyptian history and of the of the root of the hieroglyphs of the of the writing of the Egypts and she actually published scientific papers on Egyptology and she got grants for research so she really was an academic for Egyptian history and she was well known for it so she made like a 180 degree turn from this showgirl turned costume designer turned actress and like Hollywood elite to scientist who would work in the fields, in the pyramids, in Egypt, who would publish papers and who would just be very invested in finding out more about it. So I think she's... It's just fascinating. I think I said the word about 10,000 times already, but I really, truly think she is. She was just everything. She was beautiful. She was smart. She was independent. She was very self-secure. She was confident in who she was. She never wanted to be beaten down. She didn't want to be held down. She always looked for new ways. She got where her attention was, where her enthusiasm went, where her joy went, what she was interested in. And she gave it her all. She always was fully invested and as long as it was good. And if she started to feel, oh, this ain't good anymore, this could be better, she just pivoted. And I think this is just so important. So I give you the five lessons that I got from Natasha Rambova. And that is a strong will, a strong sense of what you want. She very early on did things against the will of her parents at an age where some people today still don't know what they actually want. So you have to be able to listen to what you really want and back yourself. Be in tune with who you are, what you want and say, yes, this is what I want. This is who I am. And just have the will to push through. Just be in tune with your wants and your needs and your desires. Second, Rambova tried things. She tried belly. She tried costume designing. She tried acting. She tried being married. She tried Egyptology. She tried writing. She tried jewelry. She tried it all. You can only find things that you're good at, that you enjoy if you try and if you're just determined to do what makes your heart sing. The third is she decided. She decided what she wanted and she took risks when deciding. She decided against the will of her parents. It was a risk, but she did it. She decided to go with Koslov to Los Angeles. Risk, she did it. She decided to marry Valentino. She decided to leave him and Hollywood behind and go back to New York and start from scratch. She, it was a total risk. She did it. She fled to France, left everything behind. Total risk, totally her decision. She's just behind her decisions. She takes risks and just forges ahead. The fourth thing is independence. She never wanted to be dependent on a man, on her parents, of someone providing her with means. She always tried to make her own way. She always tried to find what would make money, what would make her heart sing, how she could be independent and live a life according to her needs, wants and desires, which I think is the most important thing. And the last thing 
which I think I already mentioned in the episode about Mae West. She was flexible. She pivoted. She was not attached to something so much that she would sink with it. Had she been so attached to New York, to the dancing career, she would not have gotten where she went. Has she gotten so invested and so attached to the marriage or to the status that she got from being married to Valentino, she might not have gone on and find her real passion, which was lying in Egypt. She was just flexible. She was open. She was seeing things as they were. She was not glossing over things. She was seeing things as they were. She knew what she wanted. And then she just took decisions, being flexible on how to reach the best possible solution. And you cannot plan that kind of life. This, I think, is the most important lesson. Because when I was younger, I tried to plan my life. I thought there were like clear steps. Because usually people, when you're young, say, oh, do you have a five-year plan? Where would you see yourself in five years? And this question can really be like overwhelming because you have no idea. Yes, you can have like a feigned plan. And usually if you're getting asked that, you're like in an interview for a job and you're just coming up with things they want to hear. And you can have five-year plans. You can have milestones that you want to reach. But for a really interesting, really extraordinary, unique life, you cannot plan. You can be devoted to your path. You can be devoted to finding and nurturing what is you, the essence of you. And you can devote your life to being flexible on how to reach certain goals. But you cannot plan an extraordinary life. And I think that's very important because I know a lot of people who have planned their lives and who have ticked off all the boxes that they have set themselves who are not happy. And I have worked really hard and like breaking down all the barriers in my head because there are so many. And if you really look at it, you might see them as well. Um, I, I look at it as, you know, the generation before us, they had a very strict outset of life. They got born, they got to school, they had education and their apprenticeships. Then they worked for a company for 40, 50 years. Then they got into retirement, got money for being retired, and then they died. And it was, in, in, in one way, it was kind of neat because you knew how life was. You knew when you were secure safe, when you were taken care of, you knew like the progression of life, what would happen. Yes, it gave you some kind of ease. There was not that much of insecurity, I think, from where your life would lead. On the other hand, it's very depressing because you knew where your life would lead. And we don't have that now less than ever before because like there are trillions of ways of how your life could go, how you could plan it. They're not like, okay, you have your A-levels, you have to go on to university and you can become a doctor and lawyer and I don't know, an accountant and that's it. No, you have like an unlimited number of careers you can choose. You have an unlimited number of ways you can live your life. You could have you know, your love relationships could be any way you like. You can have kids without being married. You can be married without kids. You can be like single. You can be whatever. There are too many options nowadays. So you cannot plan anymore. But you can take those five lessons from Rambova, which I think are really important, and create a life dedicated to that and dedicated to listening what makes your heart sing, where you, your essence is driving you to. So I hope you are now going to Google and Wikipedia Natasha Rambova because she is one of the people in old Hollywood that I really admire. And as I said before, there are lots more and I guarantee you I'm going to show you some more that you will like as much. I like talking to you a lot and I hope I can talk to you next week again. Bye. Bye.